This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bruce, can you, you won't, can you, you can. Aloha. I'm Aisha Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles. We are on a 10,000 year odyssey. So tell me, muse, of that plant of many resources, which wandered far and wide, the ancient plant of food, fuel, and fiber. Historically, dietary use of the raw cannabis plant brings us back in line with 34 million years of cannabis evolution. Dr. William L. Courtney wrote, while our perception, publication of these properties are new, the phenomenal beneficial effects were there yesterday, last year, hundreds of millions of years ago. And so, thus our odyssey begins. As we venture past these 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which the cannabis derives, the many uses of the plant, hemp, cannabis, hashes, cannabis in religion, cannabis in medicine, and dear old cannabis and Uncle Sam. Today, our special guest is Mr. Theo Alexander, MHA. And he's been employed in the field of healthcare administration for 10 plus years as, and has a professional experience and education that gives him the opportunity, the level of experience to talk about exactly where we're going today. And that is the opioid addiction. Now, it's been all over the news, but the opiate addiction is a tragedy. And let's look at the opiate abuse. It's scary sounding, right? Something about 19,000 Americans died of an overdose in what, the year 2014. There's no telling how many there are since then. Let me tell you a story. This is a story about Christopher Brown, a Marine veteran who served in the U.S. military for 10 years before he was injured in Afghanistan and received a medical discharge. Opiates represented a decade of struggle with pain, the kind of physical and emotional pain that would leave you somewhere between life and death, wondering what could possibly be worse that in existence seems a mockery of the word life. Brown wrote, I was getting about two hours of sleep every few days, not caring about anything except my next dose, counting my pills all day to make sure I had enough of everything for the fentanyl that would wear off and I would go into withdrawals. I wanted to die. In 2012, Brown received a medical cannabis authorization in Massachusetts and waited three years for the dispensary to open its doors. He said, I was amazed at the pain relief I got from cannabis. It helped with my migraines, my anger, my depression, and my anxiety. Within five months, I was finished with most of my VA meds. So, I asked Theo Alexander to come talk to us about exactly what the captain was going through, what veterans and their families go through. And um, Theo, that's what he does. He works with veterans to assist them with this very issue of PTSD, broken bones, whatever. And as we know, they keep writing prescriptions for opiates. 
all kinds of opiates. So, what is there to say? How does, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Theo. Good afternoon. How you doing? Tell us about these issues yeah. that the veterans go through. And, and I must add that it's not just veterans that have yeah. opiate addictions, but others it's also. The board, yes. It's across the board. Yeah. But your specialty is veterans, so we're going to talk about veterans. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me on the show um, to discuss this very important issue. Um, this is the issue that's plaguing uh, the majority of the United States. As uh, recently, uh, um, Donald Trump has announced that we have a, a crisis on our hands um, for the epidemic of drug abuse um, when it comes to the opioids. Um, opioids have a definite say in our medical economy as far as being able to treat people for pain and other things. Um, problem is, it's, it's gotten out of hand when it comes to overriding of prescriptions. Um, diversion when it comes to the cell street opioids and things like that. Um, synthetic opioids that are coming onto the market that people are getting readily available. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a very serious concern in the veteran community. Well, wait a minute now. Um, when we say opiate, is that a class of drugs or is that a single drug? It's a class of drugs. It's a general classification of drugs. And I'm not the, the pharmacist or an expert when it comes to um, what the drugs are called and different Do brand names name and things that? they come under. Um, but they are prescribed very readily um, to the veteran community and also to the, the medical community that suffer from pain and other debilitating symptoms. Um, the problem we're having is the education that most veterans have when it comes to the danger of opioids. Of course, there's always a danger of overdose or a deadly overdose. And this is what we've been experiencing here in the United States. We've been seeing the numbers of overdose, accidental overdose, going up. At this point, we have almost 30 a day veterans uh, falling to the, to the epidemic of accidental overdose drugs. Well, tell me this with, now, I, I don't know. So it was heroin and oxycodone and yeah. Vicodin, are those opiates? So heroin and oxycodone um, are fentanyl. definitely opiates. Fentanyl. They are a class of, uh, of opiates that are designated um, to be prescribed only for certain ailment, you know, mostly for chronic pain. But where I see the problem is, is when people go to the hospital, the veterans go and present themselves for chronic pain, then they, of course, are given maybe four or five different choices of opioids they could do, use, or be prescribed to, to alleviate some of that pain. And so when they're given their prescription, of course, they go and they take it. They build a tolerance for it. If they're on it or, or three to four weeks, they'll build a tolerance. And here in line is the danger. When they go back to their physician and complain about pain, their pain threshold is, is either not decreasing or is, is remaining the same. Um, oftentimes, the, 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 the dosage just increase. So the doctor just writes a stronger prescription? After, after proper uh, assessment of the patient, uh, I'm sure the doctor is acting in the favor of uh, medical protocol. Um, and yes, sometimes they will increase the dosage to alleviate the pain for the patient, as it really originally prescribed for the patient. And sometimes that pushes the patient closer to an addiction point. What, now addiction is in the brain, so what is this doing to the, to the brain? <laughs> is this, is it is the opiate telling the brain you don't have pain? Is that it? From what I understand, uh, the opioids, they interact in the body as far as turning on and off receptors, um, as far as the nerve endings. So when it turns them off, you no longer have a sensation in that area, of course, alleviating the pain or subsiding the pain. The danger in that is... But they don't really cure. No, they're, they, they're not they a just, class of curing drugs. There is no evidence that opioids will not cure. It's only for temporary relief. Of, of chronic pain. Oh, so you still have whatever the issue was, you still have it? Yes, well, well our bodies are very dynamic. Usually when opioids are prescribed, it's to reduce the pain level while our bodies are healing. Say, for instance, in the case of a broken bone. Um, of course, it's very painful. You're going to go through that series of, of healing. Um, when the bone is healed, then, of course, you shouldn't have any pain. Maybe you lose range of motion, 
according to you know where the break was or whatnot, you have physical therapy for that. But even through that series of treatment, you will still be prescribed some type of pain medication. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now we said that we were going to talk about using medical cannabis. Yes. To with this opiate addiction. So what would medical cannabis do when a person is addicted to one of these opiates? Yeah, so um, hopefully we get into the area of uh, medical treatment where cannabinoids and opioids can be uh, simultaneously prescribed to the patient or recommended to the patient. Um, what we have seen is that with opioids um, and the overdose mortality, okay, States that have brought about a cannabis program into their to their um, protocol, their medical protocol or option for treatment, have dropped um, as far as the uh, overdoses by 25 percent. Some some states by 33 percent. So they give it not a, with the opiate or to wean them off of the opiate. It can be done in either case. Um, with the VA, of course, we don't. The, the VA does not. Um, prescribe or recommend cannabis. So the, uh, the veteran definitely is left out to the community doctors to get that advice and things. But as far as an option to reduce the opioid addiction or even the threshold of uh, increasing a dosage in opioid, as I mentioned before, if a patient is still increasing, their, their playing threshold has not subsided and they still need a higher dose of medication. Um, sometimes with can cannabis that we've seen in some patients, it reduces that opportunity to get a higher doses of opioid. Okay, so tell me now, I have been prescribed yes. the opioid yes. and I become addicted to it. Does the cannabis, can it help through the withdrawals? Can it help yes. alleviate the addiction? How, yes, how, we, we, how, we have seen that evidence in uh, some of the patients we, we, that we treat. Um, everyone's different, of course, um, but the overall goal is to reduce the symptoms of withdrawal and an addiction to opioid therapy, and we have seen cannabis improve that opportunity for most, most patients. And sometimes they stop taking the opioid because, of course, cannabis has the opportunity to decrease pain as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the recommending um, opportunities for us to, to get the cannabis card, the future nine, or access to cannabis. So, so if you got your cannabis card yes. and you're a veteran and Uncle Sam's not going to take care of this, yes. so you can go to a, any one of these doctors that are listed that you got the card from. Yes. So that would get you through the withdrawals. Yes. So what happens with a withdrawal? What happens when you take the cannabis? Mm -hmm. what, what are the process of getting you through the withdrawals. Yes. So from what I've seen, um, the withdrawal symptoms when, when it comes to opioids, the, I don't know what the technical. No, I meant the, yeah, go ahead. The technical t um, way of describing how it will really affect the body, um, that the CB1 and CB2 receptors, okay, it's going to reduce the opportunity for, for pain. Of course, we know that nerve endings is where the pain centers are, and when that, that area is inflamed, it causes pressure on that area. Um, and I'm not a medical scientist, so I'll do my best to describe how the mechanism <laughs> well, I tell would you operate. What, we need to take a break, yes. <laughs> and when we come back, let's see if we can get through step by step by step how yes. this helps and why it should be. Okay. Okay, great. Let's, let's take a break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii's Volunteer Chief Operating Officer and occasional host, and this is Minky. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online, web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks, Think Tech will run only during the month of November, 
and you can help. Please donate what you can so ThinkTech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktech.cosbach.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30-plus weekly shows, thank you, mahalo, and shishi for your generosity. Questions after withdrawal. Hi, and we're back. We're talking about opiates, the opiate addiction, the crisis, and medical cannabis. Now, my thought is that the cannabis can help you come down off of the withdrawal, through the withdrawals. Yes. So I'm talking to Theo Alexander, who is a brilliant young man and my go-to <laughs> about <laughs> cannabis because I know nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, <laughs> but the president has said that we have a crisis, and we know we yes, do. We do. I don't know that he said how we were going to deal with it, but we do. Yes. Now, so we got this crisis, and we've got people that are strung out on this stuff. Yes. Even long after the medical issue is gone, now yes. they've got another issue. Yes. Now they're addicted. Okay. So if they're addicted and they take the cannabis to get off the addiction. Mm -hmm. Can we deal with that? How does that work? So with, with, with withdrawal symptoms, as we was talking about before, before we went to the break, um, you have nausea, you have like cold sweats, some people have nightmare and other things that are wrapped up with that. Um, with cannabis, it does subside most of those things. A lot of the addiction pro, um, symptoms or um, side effects to getting off of opioids are similar to what people experience in PTSD, um, physical pain, nightmares, um, emotional numbing, things like that, um, guilt or shame, irritability, um, memory loss. A lot of those things happen when people get off of opioids. You know, those, they have an episode of health, of care that may go down. Um, when we put them on or recommend cannabis to them, um, the nausea is subsided. Um, a lot of times, appetite is lost when you're having, um, as, a, as a side effect to opioid addiction, you don't really eat a lot. So as far as increasing uh, appetite, cannabis does that as well. Um, with nightmares, we know that it has alleviated a lot of a nightmare or reoccurring nightmares with veterans with PTSD. Um, a number of different symptoms. It doesn't alleviate everything, but our hope is that it is less it, so it less. eases you through. The yeah, it, it makes it a little easier to get through the withdrawal symptoms. Um, it alleviates a lot of the symptoms. Like I said, the nausea is totally alleviated mm -hmm. when it comes to the, the um, administration of cannabis. But it's our hope that the person has a safer opportunity to use something that was maybe detrimental to their to their body and to their. So this their is system. a safe way of. Now, I I don't know any of this. But I've read about methadone, is that it? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, I had one young man tell me the methadone was worse than the oxycodone. I've heard the same thing from some of our clients. Um, and methadone, of course, is administered as a, um, when people are addicted to heroin or things mm -hmm. like that, or some of your opioids, they use the methadone to curb the side effects. And, of course, the methadone is a very harsh uh, drug that has a potential of increasing suicide, um, homicide. Um, it's very harsh on the body. Well, that's what this young man told me. And so he said that he wanted to try the cannabis and he yeah. needed to get the card and, and all of this. Yeah. But in telling me this story, because like I'm learning, yes. so I, oh keep asking, <laughs> I keep asking. Yeah. And he said the methadone was just worse. And he went back to the oxycodone yeah. because... And, and, the, and that's unfortunate because the, the methadone met was put in place to curb... The well, that's what he effect. said. Yes. It, and, you know, and like I said, our plethora of, of different drugs that are, that are available in the Western model of, of, of uh, health care delivery, um, they're there to help. You know? So we're dealing with this problem as a medical system. How do we do it? I think cannabis is a choice. 
that we need to look at, look more to than not. Um, of course, with the state's rights situation with some states is coming up. Um, just the fact that Cory Booker has introduced um, some uh, a bill to be able to take cannabis off the Schedule One list so that we can have it more readily available. Physicians, researchers, patients would have the opportunity then to clearly look at cannabis as a choice um, for pain, you know, to manage some of the symptoms that opioids have been administered or prescribed for, for the patient. Well, yeah, he's, this young man was a veteran and he said that this young man I was telling you about, Brown, Christopher Brown, and he was telling me that he didn't have an addiction before he was prescribed yes. this stuff. Yes. And, and I mean, he got pretty banged up in, in, in Afghanistan, yes. but he didn't have, now he's discharged because he's unable to yes. do his job. Of course. He got a medical discharge. And be, with the medical discharge, he's got prescriptions for the rest of his life. Yes. And all they're doing is making him worse. He yes, says it's worse. It's a very convenient program when you're in the, in the VA to get prescription for pain medication. Of course, they want to help treat the backlog of, of, of victims who have had not been treated before. So I can see where some overcompensation may be come to play when it comes to the physicians or psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, looking at the, 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 um, the veteran to improve their health outcome. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to opioids, there should be more of a treatment protocol that extends the um, health outcome for the veterans. Say, for instance, there should be some type of uh, activities that are employed, some type of dietary um, advice that's given um, so that the veteran takes his health care from a holistic standpoint, not being dependent on the opioid itself. If we can get them to use cannabis, to use outdoor activity or outdoor therapeutic opportunities to kind of act as a combination to help the, the veteran recover. A lot of times when they do recover from the accident itself, they still have some symptoms that needs to be rehabbed, maybe with physical therapy or occupational therapy, things like that. But I would say that that's not prescribed as often as the drug itself. You know, as far as opioids, it seems like it's the go-to choice to manage the entire episode of care versus adding other things. Um, so you're yeah. saying that along with the cannabis, there yes. should be all of these other things, the physical therapy, emotional therapy, yes. all of this. Yes. Because one of the things that the Major Brown said, he was, you know, his poor wife and family was just struggling with him. Yes. Yes. And with his, he, all he could think about was the fentanyl yes. and not the family. And yes. once he started doing the cannabis, he could think about the family, he could enjoy them. He exactly. didn't have all of this other yes. stuff going on. Yes, and we often, um, as a part of what we do when it comes to cannabis and helping the veteran wean themselves off of addictive medications or just find a better treatment protocol, is we do refer the veteran to outdoor activities, what we call recreational therapy, um, whether that's horticulture therapy or getting out in the environment and just planting something, you know. It's very therapeutic to go out in nature as it is. Um, doing things like planting vegetables and harvesting, um, riding horses, which the equine therapy is something we do out in Makaha, um, aqua therapy, you know, swimming with the dolphins. There's many programs that we have here. Of course, we're in, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, so there's a lot of things you can do, you know, on the beach and stuff like that. So we try to get veterans together who are suffering from addiction or just the result of their accidents in the military or war era um, uh, syndromes, PTSD, Gulf War syndrome. We try to get them into the group therapy opportunities to go out and experience more recreation outdoor. Take them outside the therapeutic office or the, the office of the clinician, and it's just a straight line relationship and it's prescription given and they're out there at the yeah. door, you know. So we try to get them back into an active lifestyle. And this is where you're starting to hear some of the things where children and the spouse would say, yes, we have our husband, our, our father back, or, you know, our, our mothers, you know, we can now enjoy our mother. She's not as, you know, grumpy or just disgruntled, you know, saying because of her condition or because of the medication she's taking, though. So we've seen the evidence of how other therapeutic opportunities will bring the veteran closer to reality of healing. And so, and, and that's what can we kind of recommend. So even though we have this opioid situation hanging over our head, 
it's really becoming very detrimental. I, I have all um, hope that we as a medical community can overcome and utilize things like cannabis, other botanical um, medicinal aids um, that would help the person have a better choice for pain management and whatnot. So others, was that the CBD? What yes. Is, what, what exactly is CBD and, and cannabis? What, what's, okay. So we used them in the same sentence, yes. but they're not. So what is the difference? In, in a nutshell, we have two variations of medication that's being thrown around a little bit as far as uh, the recommendation. Here in Hawaii, we have the 329 card, which gives you access to dispensaries, which has TEC. A 329 card is, is that the one you get from the state? Yes, it's the Medical Marijuana Registry oh, okay. card program. So any qualifying person can get their card and have access to our dispensaries, which you can go in and purchase uh, dry herb, uh, oils, tinctures, uh, some topicals, and so, and, and vapes as well. But with that, we have the opportunity to have CBD. CBD is not illegal uh, in, in any of the 50 states. So CBD is a non-psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. So it won't make you high? It won't get you high. Okay. Uh, it won't get you high at all. And so, but what it will do is it will give you the other effects of the medication. All the other benefits. As far as reducing nausea, reducing pain, okay. and things like that, yes. So it, Inflammation. It, it'll do all of those things? Yes, it will. But it yeah. doesn't make you high? Yes. And so, in my opinion, CBD is a, it's a more, um, how you say? Uh, Friendly. It's a more friendly, yes, yeah, you're right. It's more friendly, but the utilization of CBD um, is, is, is a little better than the THC because THC, of course, some people still have jobs, they right. still have livelihood. Um, so having, you don't have a dirty pee test. You don't have you a don't, dirty uh, pee, oh, your analysis, good. yes. And yes. so that's the key with CBD. And also having it available, you can go to smoke shops, you can go to Whole Foods, down to Earth, and they have different variations of CBD at different strengths, so you can have that available. So. But yes, I, I would definitely say CBD is an option when it comes to botanical-derived uh, medications that are helpful for pain and things. Yes. Yeah. Well, now tell us, since you're offering these things for the veteran, tell us your web page or telephone number so we can put it up and anybody, any veteran that wants to come be yes. part of your organization. Yes. So give us how we can contact you, okay. your telephone number and your email address yes, or well, website or whatever you want. Okay. The best way to get in touch with me, because we, we like to work directly with the client uh, or the patient so that you can get the best advice available, um, you can reach me at 808-728-3338. Again, this. Say it again. 808-728-3338. <laughs> Just ask for Theo. Uh, uh, you'll be calling Complimentary Alternative Medicines of Oahu or CAMO for short, but me and my staff will we'll be there happy to help you um, and I hope I get a couple of calls soon <laughs> definitely okay and that email email you can reach us at 808 camo C -A -M -O? At, yes 808 camo C -A -M -O at gmail.org great well Theo thank you so much for spending this time yes. with us and we look forward to coming back thank you for having me it's thank always you. good to see you Aloha. Uh, aloha. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Aloha.